happening during this pandemic. There has been an alarming rise in incidents of gender-based violence during COVID-19 and an increase in severity. Unfortunately, the numbers where available global, globally are staggering. In Canada, some reports are showing 30% increase. In the US, some states are reporting 21 to 35% increase in violence. And the reports in other countries of up to three-fold increase in, in violence during COVID, uh, specifically happening during imposed quarantines. This will be one of the devastating and lasting effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight's event is being held at a perfect time when it couldn't be more pressing to shed light on this important topic. Let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Sarah Tatsis. I'm Vice President of Advanced Technology Development Labs at BlackBerry and also President of Seroptibus International of Kitchener Waterloo. Tonight, we have a fantastic lineup, um, starting with Susie Dunn's talk on deep fakes and digital harms, the use of emerging technology and gender-based violence. And then we'll follow up with that uh, with a really interesting panel discussion on the ways that emerging tech impact women and girls' safety and talk about uh, prevention and solutions. Joining us then will be Nikki Carswell from the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region, Dr. Sarah Shoker from University of Waterloo. I'll be back in joining that panel. And that panel will also be moderated by Dr. Courtney Duagu. I can't promise you that you'll be less afraid after tonight's event, but I hope you will understand this important topic better. Let it color your perspective on how emerging technology is being used to perpetrate gender-based violence and join in the fight to end this violence in whatever way you can. Before we get started though, I have a, a couple of, of different people I wanna thank. First of all, I wanna thank you, the audience for joining us tonight. Thank you for your time, for your attention. Just joining this fabulous event shows that this is a topic that either you're passionate about or you're really interested in knowing more about and you're in great company tonight. I'd also like to thank all of our awesome speakers in advance for agreeing to join us. Uh, we have such a great group. I know that we'll get into some really interesting topics tonight. And thank you all. We really appreciate it. This event is brought to you by Seroptimist International of Kitchener-Waterloo. And Seroptimist International, for those of you that don't know, has clubs in a, more than 120 countries throughout the world. The organization's mission is to improve the lives of women and girls through programs leading to social and economic empowerment. And in Kitchener and Waterloo specifically, where, where I'm coming to you from tonight and most of our speakers are, um, we're running two key programs. One is the Dream It Be It program and another is Live Your Dream program. And the Dream It Be It program is specifically focused on career support for girls and Live Your Dream awards are uh, cash awards that we give to women who are primary financial supporters for their families in need of financial help and um, who want to go back or go and continue with post-secondary education or vocational schooling. Um, and we're really happy and very thankful and pleased to partner with uh, the Center for International Governance Innovation, also known as CG, uh, to bring you this event. CG is an independent nonpartisan think tank whose peer-reviewed research and trusted analysis influence policymakers to innovate. Uh, through their global network of multidisciplinary researchers and strategic partnerships, CG provides policy solutions for the digital era with one goal, to improve people's lives everywhere. I'd really like to thank CG for partnering with us on this event. Um, you can visit uh, cgonline.org uh, to check out past and upcoming events if you're interested. I also want to uh, give a special thank you to our sponsor, which is BlackBerry. So many of you today are joining us from Kitchener Waterloo and know BlackBerry very well. Uh, BlackBerry is no longer uh, a smartphone company of the past, but rather has transformed itself into a leading intelligence security software and services company. And the company leverages AI machine learning to deliver innovative solutions in the area of cybersecurity, safety and data privacy solutions. So safety, security, privacy are all relevant to today's event and we're really thrilled that BlackBerry is sponsoring the event. So thanks BlackBerry. So now for some housekeeping, uh, Andrea mentioned we'll be using the QA function. Uh, so in, if you have questions from the audience, please make use of that. 
The QA box is at the bottom of your screen and we'll, we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, also in the chat function, we'll, we'll be sharing speakers bios. So their full bios, um, you can actually access them there. And then uh, for those of you that joined a little bit later, I'll just repeat um, that we, we, we also know that this topic may be triggering for some people. Um, so there are some resources if you scroll up in the chat, if you need to reach out for so to someone for support. So without further delay, uh, that was quite a long intro, but I got through it. Um, without further, further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Susie Dunn. Susie is a senior fellow at CG and a PhD student and part-time professor at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law. She currently teaches uh, contract law at the university and has guest lectured on law and technology. Her research centers on the intersection of gender equality, technology, and the law with a specific focus on non-consensual distribution of intimate images deep fakes and impersonation in digital spaces. Thanks, Susie. Great, thank you so much for that, uh, that really wonderful uh, introduction. I actually have a real soft spot for the Soroptimus Foundation as well too, because they, uh, they awarded me a scholarship a, a few years back and helped fund some of the research that I've done. So uh, a big thank you to them for that. Um, so I'm going to start the conversation um, today with a, a bit of an overview of some of the research um, that I'm doing in the area of deep fakes and digital misrepresentations. Uh, but overall today, we're going to have a really broad conversation. I think our panelists are going to get down on some really narrow issues, such as um, the ways that human trafficking um, is impacted by digital technologies, all the way to looking at the larger picture of how does um, what is the global um, impact of, of uh, various digital harms? So it's going to be a really innovative and dynamic conversation. Um, so what we're seeing um, is, is exactly uh, what Sarah was saying. Uh, technology facilitated violence, just like other forms of gender-based violence is on the rise. Uh, even prior to COVID, because our lives are becoming more digitally mediated, um, it's much more common to see violence um, enacted in these spaces as they become integrated and normal parts of our everyday life. You know, when we think of increases in violence against women and other forms of gender-based violence, you know, tech is, is embedded in that now. And so whenever you see increases in regular forms of gender-based violence, you'll be likely seeing increases in, in tech-facilitated violence as well. Um, we're seeing some old forms of tech violence um, being amplified by new technologies. So, for example, when we think of things such as um, stalkerware, um, stalking is something that's not new. You know, we're, we're women who've been experiencing um, stalking um, for, for ages. Um, but, but stalkerware is a new form of technology that's a, a type of software that can be installed on someone's phone, and then the abuser can have access to their location, the photos they're taking, the text messages they're sending, and it really um, amplifies their ability to monitor this person. And, and often this technology is installed without the, the knowledge or consent of the, the person who's being monitored. Um, since COVID-19 has occurred, um, many of us are working from home, living from home. While there's not any organization in Canada that's collecting data on technology facilitated violence, there are organizations out of the United Kingdom and Australia. And, and since the pandemic's happened, they've seen astronomical raises in the amounts of reporting on non-consensual distribution of intimate images, which is uh, problematically known as revenge porn, um, and also uh, cyber stalking. And so we are seeing this increase um, in, in specifically tech facilitated violence during the times of COVID. And uh, many of you who are, who are paying attention to um, online hate groups will be aware that, uh, that this week and, and for the following few weeks, uh, the trial of Alec Misanis, who is uh, a, a member of an incel community, um, is, is at trial right now. And so these online groups are perpetuating really negative stereotypes about women and very harmful messages about them. Uh, and the incel community is a, a group of people who are involuntarily celibates. And so they feel sexually entitled um, to have access to, to women. And they feel because they haven't been able to access women in the way that they want, um, that one of the responses to that is to get revenge on, on these women and on general society by enacting violence. And, and you know, in Toronto, that led to the death of, of 10 people who were um, hit by this van that this man was driving and, and 16 other people who were injured. 
The research that I do is on tech facilitated violence generally, but more specifically on uh, deep fake technology and, uh, and what I'm calling digital misrepresentations. Uh, many of you will be familiar with deep fakes. You've probably seen some funny ones online. Uh, this is a screenshot of a deep fake that was made of Steve Buscemi. And so um, what was done was it was a video of Jennifer Lawrence who was uh, giving an interview after the Golden Globes and this deep fake technology was used to transfer Steve Buscemi's face onto this video. So you can watch it and see um, her speaking, but what you see is Steve Buscemi's face on top of it. So this is a clever, playful example of deep fakes. Um, but what deep fakes do is they map out, it's an artificial uh, intelligence uh, technology that maps out a person's face. So the, the program is fed a large collection of images of a particular person. And the technology then learns um, the person's uh, shape of their face, their eye color, the, the way they move their face. And once it's learned this, it, it's able to then superimpose this on videos. And an organization um, called um, Sensity um, has, has been doing research on deep fakes. And what they found is that um, most deep fakes, 96% um, uh, the last time that they did account, were sexual deep fakes featuring women where the women hadn't consented to be in these videos. And so what's happening is that women's sexuality is being co-opted. They're being represented in ways that they don't want to be represented. Um, many of the people who are being targeted are people that um, there's sexual interest towards them. So it's celebrities um, out of the UK, uh, the US and, and largely out of South Korea, which is interesting because you don't see the same um, division when you look at non-sexual deep fakes, which are mostly made of, of white male celebrities. So there is a racial aspect to the, the creation of sexual deep fakes. And so 96% are being um, made of these women um, and mostly they're, they're of celebrities uh, and, and they're quite realistic. Many celebrities have said that people will know that they're fake because you know, Scarlett Johansson likely didn't make the sex video. Um, but they've also been made of different people as a form of harassment. So they're problematic when they're made of celebrities for so-called sexual entertainment because it's a violation of women's sexual autonomy, but they're actually targeting specific people to harass them. So we've seen this used against um, human rights defenders. Uh, there was an example in India where a woman had a, a hate campaign um, against her, her name was Rana Ayub, and, uh, and one of the, the campaign uh, tactics was to create a sexual deep fake of her that looked very realistic. And once that was released, people were calling for sexual violence against her, um, and it was a very traumatic experience. So it was a part of a larger campaign to discredit and humiliate um, this woman. And, and we've seen the same thing with um, videos of some of the women who were in the Gamergate um, harassment campaign have had deep fakes made of them as well. So it's, it's a really problematic form of technology. And it also allows people um, to misuse women's bodies in a way that replicates uh, very gendered stereotypes about the idea that women should remain sexually accessible um, to, to men regardless um, of their consent in the matter. Other forms of technology that I've been studying include um, something called um, deep nudes. And so deep nudes use a similar form of technology, but rather than swapping the face of the person, it swaps out the body. So in these cases, someone can take a still image of a woman and, and it only works on women. The technology is highly gendered. It wouldn't work on a male body. And you can feed this image into this program and what's produced is a nude, uh, what would appear to be a nude image, realistic looking nude image of what this woman would likely look like um, naked. And, and the difference between deep nudes and deep fakes is that for deep nudes, um, statistics have shown that this isn't being done on celebrities at the same number as deep fakes are. This is generally being done on women that people know personally, friends, ex-girlfriends, uh, and also random women that they're finding their images on Instagram. Um, other forms of technology that's um, misappropriating women's sexuality includes virtual reality avatars 
where we're seeing virtual reality avatars of particular people, again, leaning more towards celebrities, but there are some of individual women where then whoever's using the virtual reality can go in and choose to sexually interact with this person in a virtual um, scene in any way that they would like. Um, and, and again, this is the sexual co-option of women's identities. Other forms of digital misrepresentations that are coming up, because in reality, there are these interesting advances of technology that are being misused. Deep fakes are really problematic. Deep nudes, virtual reality, um, non-consensual pornography is, 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 is very problematic. But in reality, most people who are perpetrating gender-based violence are using simple technologies. They're using text messaging, they're using social media, and they're using that as their tools to enact violence. And some examples that we've seen, one is creating fake profiles. Um, and when you create a fake profile of someone, um, you can have them say things that are um, offensive or humiliating, or you can use it to actually draw physical violence towards them. So one quite famous case out of the United States was a man named Matthew Herrick. And Matthew Herrick was a gay man who was in a relationship with his partner. And when that relationship ended, his ex-partner um, repeatedly created fake profiles of him on the, the dating profile grinder and would send men to his home, to Matthew Herrick's home and workplace who would be expecting um, to have a sexual encounter with this, with this person. And this happened over months, um, I believe almost years. And, and he had hundreds, if not thousands of people show up to his home and his workplace demanding sexual interactions with him. So these digital harassments can actually lead to real world interactions that put people at risk. Uh, we've also seen the case of fake websites being created in order to destroy the livelihood and well-being of, of, of uh, particular people. There was a case in British Columbia where a man named uh, Patrick Fox was in a, a heated custody dispute with his ex-wife. And what he said he was going to do and, and did try to do, and he said this to media, he said this to the police, was that he was going to do whatever he could within his power to drive his ex-wife to uh, suicide or homelessness. And he created a web page using her name, um, her private information, her home address, or her contact information, and then a lot of false information about her, calling her a racist, a white supremacist, a bad mother, and a drug addict, and then made this, this website public, and it was her first and last name, .com, so this would come up in Google searches. So these are more simple technologies that are being used in the same way to misrepresent women in, in an extremely harmful way. Um, so, so that's the research that I'm, I'm doing, and I'm happy to take more questions um, at the end of the event. But before I, we move on, I wanted to plug some of the research that I'm doing with CG in partnership with um, the IDRC, who's, who's funding this program. And so we're working on a, a two-year program called Supporting a Safer Internet, where we are going to be surveying 18 countries about people's experiences with online gender-based violence. And, and two things that I think are really important about this project is one, it's gonna create empirical data. Right now there's very little empirical studies that exist on tech facilitated violence. And those that do exist are generally centered on experiences um, in Europe, uh, in North America and in Australia. And so there's a need for data in those areas as well, but largely globally, there's a lack of data of what this violence looks like. And so this study, we're going to be um, looking um, mainly at, at lower and middle income countries. We're going to be looking at several countries in Latin America, in Africa, and getting data um, that, that really is needed to help uh, policymakers, civil society organizations understand what this issue is and understand how to uh, create better uh, solutions and supports for um, ending um, online gender-based violence. And we'll be producing um, several regional studies um, that analyzes this data from experts um, in those areas once, um, once the, the research has been completed. And so I think this will contribute to the growing body of knowledge on, on gender-based violence. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in, in just learning a general overview of what tech facilitated gender-based violence is, we're publishing our first paper on December 7th. It's just a general overview of what these issues are, what type of tech facilitated violence exists, what harms um, are caused by it, 
according to current research and who's impacted. So, uh, so visit CG online to look for those papers and also to um, uh, uh, see more about the project. Um, so that's that's the, the introduction that I have. I'm going to pass it to our, our lovely moderator, Courtney, to uh, continue with the conversation. Thank you very much, Susie. And, and thanks for really setting the stage and providing us with extremely important insight about topics that are rarely discussed. Um, we'll be delving a little deeper into a few of these areas throughout our moder moderated conversation uh, with our panelists and um, which include you, as well as Sarah Tatsis, Sarah Shoker, and Nikki Carswell. Um, and let, so let's begin. Um, Susie provided us with a, like a current state of her research, which includes a number of areas of different technology. So deep fakes, deep nudes, VR avatars, just, you know, kind of a bit of the, the legal landscape and, um, this broader context of what's happening with gender-based violence and, um, and technology. So I'm going to start with you, um, Sarah. So we're gonna uh, kind of zoom out. So Sarah Shoker, can you provide the audience with some examples of your research related to technology and gender-based violence from an international and global security perspective? Sure, so I, uh, my background's in political science. I, I also work uh, a little bit in tech as a, as a small founder. And generally I'm really interested in understanding the social and political implications, uh, internationally speaking, of course, uh, of emerging technologies, especially with data-driven technologies and AI. And recently also um, the gendered impacts of critical infrastructure failures. And in that regard, I've been uh, quite interested in what happens when internet services are actually withdrawn from uh, from communities. So internet shutdowns, which include um, complete internet blackouts, but can also include things like web censorship and the, uh, and the blocking of certain social media applications. Um, WhatsApp is, uh, pro is the number one uh, social media platform that has been banned internationally. And uh, in a few of the interviews that I've conducted with individuals, primarily in low and middle income countries, I ended up finding that there are some very serious gendered impacts when uh, women are deprived of internet access. Um, so if you think about the internet, I mean, I understand that people, you, you know, maybe in the global north or the so-called global north, um, we use it quite frequently, we use it quite frequently to access things like Twitter and Facebook and, you know, we use it for our daily life and it's often at the tip of our consciousness, right? Um, but the internet, of course, supports things like you know, banking systems, um, the ability to process remittances, which are very important if you're in, um, you, if you live in a lower middle income country, and also assist with the freeing of time. Um, and we know that care work, of course, is disproportionately placed on, on women. But also what I ended up finding is that in situations where there was civil unrest, so often internet blackouts occur uh, during times of government transitions, so during election periods where, um, sexual violence against women tends to be higher already, women would end up using the internet uh, to ascertain whether public space was actually safe for them. Um, and so they used the internet essentially as this early warning system or, you know, or as, a, as, a, as a tool uh, to know whether they could go to a particular protest or sit-in or whether that sit-in, for example, had been Ill infiltrated by uh, government agents that were, uh, that were trying to um, start violence and discredit a particular movement uh, by becoming perpetrators of, of uh, sexual violence themselves. Without the internet, there was no ability really to validate public safety. And so what ended up happening is that women were more likely to stay at home. Um, and of course, we, can, we might be able to see how that's problematic because essentially what, what, what that means, practically speaking, is that you don't have women who are participating in the political process at the same rate as, as their male counterparts. Um, and I'd also like to highlight some of the, I guess, the differences between um, techno technology facilitated violence in low and, middle low and middle income countries versus high income countries like in Canada. Uniting all of, the, all of these um, various experiences is a patterned resistance to women's public voice. But I think it is important to, to acknowledge that depending on 
um, the infrastructure that's in place and the tools that you have at your disposal, the experiences of women um, in low and middle income countries are, is, can sometimes be markedly different um, than those in high income countries. So in low income countries, there is actually still uh, disparity, um, perpetual disparity to who has access to the internet. And sometimes, I mean, a number of these stats, and I, I think, um, you know, as, as was rightly pointed out, uh, we don't necessarily, the statistics are, uh, they, they can be improved upon, I guess we should say. You know, we don't necessarily have a lot of empirical research, globally speaking. But what we do know is that even when you have statistics of internet usage per household, it's, uh, that doesn't necessarily, uh, that doesn't necessarily showcase some of the gendered patterns of internet usage because even within the household you might actually find that there that women are less likely to use mobile services or their computers in comparison to maybe male members male members of that household whereas in high income countries um, access to digital resources access to the internet is at parity and sometimes even higher for women so that causes that creates different challenges based on your geographic location um, so i think i'll end there and of course you know happy to, to follow up on any of those points. Great, thank you very much. And, and really on this point of, um, of access to digital tools and uh, the way that these tools are used, I'm going to switch over to Nikki and ask her from uh, the regional and community level, can you tell us about what you're actually seeing on the ground um, in the particular demographic that you serve in Waterloo at the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region? Are you seeing these uses of tools in the, in the same way, in different ways, and, um, and the harms that come with them? Yeah, so um, as coordinator of the Anti-Human Trafficking Program, I work with folks in our community who are experiencing, have experienced, or at significant risk of experiencing sexual exploitation or sex trafficking. Um, and although I work with folks of all genders, age 12 and up, I primarily work with younger girls who live with a lot of vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities such as, you know, um, backgrounds of child abuse and neglect or histories of sexual assault. They're experiencing homelessness and they struggle with mental health, maybe addictions. Um, but I, I want to be clear that when I'm talking about folks who are exploited and trafficked, I'm not talking about consensual sex workers in our community. Um, the sale of sex is legal in Canada, and its challenges within our legal framework, stigma and attitudes based in misogyny and violence that's happening both online and off that actually increases our sex worker community's risk. So tonight I'm focusing on people who are coerced and exploited and trafficked, like non-consensual. So within this work, I'm seeing these harms, but they're, they're unique to each client. So... For example, many youth in our community, they report to us feeling coerced or pressured while using online platforms like Snapchat or Instagram and Discord um, to send an intimate photo or video. And the coercion, can, it can look like peer pressure, blackmail, in exchange for online gaming currency, um, or it could be part of a greater grooming process. And what I mean by grooming is it's a process in which a perpetrator or a trafficker or an abuser um, is preparing somebody for the purpose of exploitation. So this used to happen, you know, in the community, at the mall, in parking lots, and it's moved to online spaces. So this is mainly occurring online on these platforms. And it often plays out similar to, you know, a young girl's connecting with someone online, sharing information, details about her location and herself, and she's developing what looks like online and in her life to be a real relationship. And of course, we find out later that, you know, this is really suspicious or it, maybe it's not so real. Um, but before that, there's often an intimate photo or a video that's been shared. And um, unfortunately, the majority of our cases that we work with, a client provides an intimate photo, whether it's consensual or um, coerced, and then that is actually shared more broadly without their consent. Sometimes that photo is actually transformed also without their consent into, um, so for example, uh, a client will share a sexy photo with who she thinks is her partner, but then that partner will transform it into a sex ad and post it on, I don't know, like Leo list or, or something like that and misrepresent her for the purpose of selling her. Sometimes if she's easily identifiable or she's young or the trafficker wants to shake things up a bit, he will take parts of her 
body or her face and like mishmash it with other photos um, or just use a fake photo and have her represented in that fake photo and when client shows up it's not her so you know violence can come out of that as well um, and this and when you're looking to purchase sex you know quite often in the comment section online there's there's codes there's things that we know to look for to read emojis signs symbols that tell us that we're actually purchasing someone who's younger than they're being represented as so um, there's some violence in that also many of our clients who share an image or a video later receive real life threats so their online world moves into real life and they are now getting calls and their families being threatened and um, they're very scared and it's very real and i know uh, for example we have a client who was sold to someone who purchased her for the purpose of taking a video of her and it's not hard to get information online this client also got her information and is now calling her texting her um, harassing her to continue to provide services that She's not, there's no money. It's just, he, she's so worried about this being um, spread. And, you know, it's important to note that regardless of how this is happening, whether it begins consensually or not, the internet is, is kind of permanent. Um, it's almost impossible to get rid of a photo or a video once it's out there. And, you know, it's really challenging when there's impersonation going on or revenge porn or, you know, non-consensual image sharing, because every time that video resurfaces, or even when you think it's going to resurface, folks become re-traumatized. They feel deep-seated shame, guilt, embarrassment, anger, and it's so hard to heal from something like that. And how we target, view, and treat women online just actually further perpetuates this. So that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing. <laughs> Thank you for that. And that's, that's really a lot. And um, thanks for sharing those, uh, those examples. And um, I'm actually going to turn to Sarah Tatsis because this also intersects with kind of your um, technology, cybersecurity, helping uh, people navigate online and the whole security piece. So as VP of the Advanced Technology Development Labs and president of, uh, of BlackBerry, sorry, and president of Sir Optimus International Kitchener Waterloo chapter, like this intersection of technology and women um, are particularly uh, important to you. So given what we've heard so far, what are the important conversations we need to be having about uh, the participation of women uh, in technology and particularly in cybersecurity? Yeah, yeah, thanks Courtney. Um... Yeah, I, I mean, BlackBerry's focused on creating security solutions for our customers. And a lot of that is around uh, creating new and, and using emerging technology to keep our customers safe and, uh, and their customers data private. Um, and really at this point in time, the world is at a, uh, let's say a point in time where risks and threats from a cybersecurity perspective and from a technology perspective are growing perspective are growing uh, exponentially. So the number of devices, for instance, that are being connected to the internet, um, you know, that's expanding. I think, I think there's some, some new statistics that are showing by 2025, there'll be something like 41 billion connected devices. So it's not as if it's, this is a, an issue that's, that's really going away. And the other thing is systems are becoming more complex and cyber criminals are becoming more sophisticated. Um, you know, they're attacking systems um, and, and people more frequently and with, with greater impact as well uh, day to day. Um, I think it's really kind of interesting because cybersecurity professionals in general, a lot of the time we're talking about like economic impact. Like if an enterprise gets breached, then people will lose money or you'll lose your IP from a, from a corporate perspective. But uh, as we just heard, you know, things can go much worse. There's much worse things in, in, in the world um, than, than, than the loss of uh, financials. And, you know, we know that there's a lot of technology out there that very blatantly is created to do harm, um, specifically to, to women and children. Um, and, but there's also technology out there that's been created um, that's being used in ways that it wasn't intended to. 
um, and it's being used for harm specifically. And part of that actually in, in, in my mind is that it, there's a couple of things going on there. The systems may have been left not secure um, or, you know, a, another idea on this is they've been intended for a different purpose um, and those companies have not evaluated all the risks of the technology that they've actually released into the world. Um, so, you know, there's a feature in Snapchat as an example, I'm, I'm sure if you're not using Snapchat, your teenagers are using Snapchat, you know, in there, there's a, there's a feature that, you know, in my mind, I don't even understand the use of this feature, but it's automatically on and you can go on, you can see all of your friends uh, and exactly the location they're in. So, you know, you could go on there, you can imagine as a stalker and very easily figure out where it is this person that you're trying to do harm to is. Um, you know, that, that's a technology that's designed, but I, you know, I, I think we have to really look at uh, ways, uh, really the risk assessment that's done on technology. And do we have the right people in those conversations around, if I release this technology into the world, what, what kind of harm could I do with it? And then prevent that from happening. So I think the, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of really good tools in, in companies for doing this. Like if you think about it on the quality side, you know, uh, let's say automobile makers, they look at a thousand ways uh, an automobile could go wrong. Um, and then they reduce the risk, right? Reduce the risk by engineering and making sure that these bad things can't happen. And I think like some of this needs to, to apply to technologies going forward where it's really around security by design and privacy by design, and let's say not harming people by design or safety by design as well, right? Um, so I think there's that. I also think in general, like part of the reason is I think there's some gaps too, like women are really underrepresented in technology. This is like a known thing, but they're even more so in the cybersecurity field. Um, you know, they're also underrepresented in decision-making in general and roles in, in lots of companies. And so if they're not at the table when you're making these important decisions, um, you know, they may not highlight or there may not be the opportunity to highlight the risk um, that the technology could, uh, could otherwise um, pose. So I think, you know, having very diverse groups of people within your engineering teams or technology teams is really important for, for that reason. Actually, here's a really good example. Um, and it's not really technology based, but, you know, uh, and, and I, I apologize because it's going to be a little bit funny, but the I still remember 10 years ago when Apple launched the iPad and I thought to myself, there was not a woman in that entire room when they named it iPad, because 10 years later, I still cannot in my mind conjure the vision of a tech device versus, you know, what I think of as as a feminine hygiene product. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a blind spot um, if you're not having a diverse enough team to really go through the impact of what your technology and what your, you know, decisions within the company that you're making. So just kind of two things in there. One is representation within the technology arena and cybersecurity in general. And the second is really doing that security, privacy, and, you know, uh, harm reduction by design is really where I think technology companies need to focus. And thank you. And that's really interesting. And so really looking at what those social impacts are um, at, to individuals. And I'm actually going to delve a little more into that technology piece um, in the next question. So it's more of a, a fireside chat, if you will. Um, and so we, we've already discussed uh, through Susie's um, you know, introduction and talk and uh, Nikki and Sarah and Sarah as well. Um, how the various examples of technology that can be used to enable digital harms and gender-based violence. Um, so where we have like surveillance, facial recognition technologies, deep fakes, just misinformation, what are the biggest challenges you're seeing um, now? Maybe how have they been impacted like over the last, I know a couple of you touched over this, but um, over the last 10 months because of COVID uh, where everyone is online all the time and where do you see it going in the next few years? I know that's kind of like asking you to forecast out and we're already dealing with where we are right now. So uh, if there's, uh, if you'd like to, if anyone would like to jump in there, um, I, I open it to you. 
Yeah, yeah, I can jump in. I really think what Sarah said was like right on point that like tech facilitated violence looks so different depending on your regional location, depending on your regional context, but the impact of tech facilitated violence is to silence women. You know, and it's and it's to keep women indoors, it's to keep women out of politics, and we're seeing these trends. And that's the thing that I fear the most, I think, about the, the larger societal impact is the way that um, women and trans folks and, 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 and other people who are impacted by gender-based violence aren't going to feel comfortable in digital spaces, particularly if they're talking about equality or racial issues or whatever it is. And then they don't want to become journalists. They don't want to become politicians. They don't want to become leaders in their field because it's too dangerous. And it's awful when you're going to have rape threats and death threats all day long, all night long. It's, it's, and, and, and we are seeing that globally, you know, where, where that, that impact is there. So I think that's my greatest um, concern. Um, I think one of the COVID challenges um, that I, that I see is it's hard to get help, especially if you're living in the home with your abuser, because you can't even sneak to go get help and you have to do it in the house and you have to hide your tracks on the internet and you have to try and have secret phone calls or secret connections that you then have to erase from your devices because usually devices recognize when you've had a phone call or a text or even if the, your partner isn't stalking your phone, you know, it's like that, that information is there. So I think during COVID, my greatest concern is people getting help and organizations providing help. Service providers are often having to provide help from their home. They don't have the capacity to do it. They need more funding. Uh, people like Nikki, I'm sure your organization is struggling with how to manage this COVID lockdown. And so those organizations need more help on understanding these issues and being supported um, during COVID with the technology um, they need. And then, then the third like larger picture thing that I, I think is really important is just educating people on what tech facilitated violence is. A lot of people don't know what it is. A lot of policymakers don't know what it is. People don't know to take it seriously. And we see this in the law and I, and I don't fault um, you know, everyone in the, in the legal system because it's, it's difficult to learn what all these issues are, but we are seeing this in some of our decisions where either lawyers don't understand the technology, judges don't understand the technology or victims themselves don't understand what they need to collect for digital evidence in order to explain it to the law. And so I think there's a larger need to educate people on what tech violence is and, and, and ideally to, to prevent it from happening in the beginning. Because I think I think a lot of the work that Nikki does around this idea around coercing, like coercing people to share sexual images, that's a cultural problem that we have right now where people think that's a normal everyday practice, you know, where you're like, oh yeah, I'll totally try and get that image from whoever it is. And then it's normal to share those images with people or collect images. Like that's a cultural flaw that we have that again is rooted in, in sexism and, and misogyny a lot of the time. But we, we also need to, to get down to the core issues and have that baked into our education system, have that baked into our law system into our policing system and also in what Sarah said in our in our computer engineering um, and, our, and, and people who are developing these things because even with the, the deep nude program when he first released that he's like I didn't realize that people were going to misuse it or I didn't realize it was going to be so popular and you're like are you are you joking like you're creating something that's going to make people naked like of course it's going to be used in that way and he just he claimed he just never realized what a problem it would be so i think i think education on on people who are creating the tech is, is important as well great thank you nikki would you like to jump in there yeah so like we have a lot of similar challenge thoughts on challenges anyway um first of all without a doubt since the beginning of covid and more folks being at home and online and young people being at home and online um, there has been an absolute increase in need for supports and for services our program alone has had a 30 percent increase for um, support for folks who are being exploited coerced groomed and trafficked solely online um, but in terms of some other challenges so I care a lot about our clients and our center. We just, we work so hard to educate the community about like what is human trafficking and, and how psychological and manipulative it actually is. But then there's the spread of misinformation and, and it's one of our challenges. Um, so, you know, there's groups like Kunan that we hear about and there are, are anti-maskers out there right now um, who can undo a lot of our hard work that takes months to do in a matter of just a few posts. 
um, using sensationalized and scare tactic type posts to make people believe that human trafficking is when children are being snatched out of your hands or that a child wearing a mask is actually more in danger of being trafficked because we can't tell if they're, you know, in distress. Um, it's not only is it super incorrect, but it actually harms our clients. So, you know, if people don't know what trafficking actually looks like, they don't understand how manipulative it is, they're going to be looking for people to be trafficked, not for someone who's showing other signs like, you know, isolation, withdrawal from friends and family and, and you know, change in mood and things like that. And not only that, but our clients who are seeing and hearing these messages aren't going to understand they're being trafficked and they're not going to know how to get help. So the, you know, these, these online conspiracy theories and sharing misinformation is a huge challenge for us. Another challenge, um, it's just kind of how, and I think you, you did sort of mention it, Susie, like the normalization of the online world and it's sort of addictive nature. Um, social media apps are not designed with our well-being in mind. They're, they're designed to draw us in and, and to keep us using the apps. And, you know, there's a lot of tactics that go into that. Also, social media is fun and we are in a pandemic right now and life kind of sucks outside of our online world. So we're, we're spending more time online to cope. Um, but unfortunately, with that and the addictive nature of it and the normalization of it and the happy chemicals that it, the things that it does to our brain when we're on it, I'm having a really hard time teaching people the, the dark side, the dangers, how to be safe. You know, I have clients who will not turn off that very irritating snap ma mapping feature because it's so fun and exciting and it helps with their streaks and they, they get little cartoon characters on their snap map and they're actually unsafe. Their trafficker could find them and seriously harm them and I, I can't get them to turn it off um, or change their settings or delete people or block people or just not be on social media. It's just not an option anymore. We've had to pivot um, and add them to our social media accounts. So our program has social media. Now we're using technology to keep up with folks and help and monitor and share and show curiosity and, and teach. Um, but that is an unfortunate thing. And, and I think the last challenge that I have um, is the speed in which this online world is, is changing. And it is my job to keep up with apps and online grooming and ways that girls are being bought and sold online and misrepresented and, and how photos work and things like that. And I actually am struggling to keep up with that because I think I get it and then it changes. You know, Bitcoin came out and I was like, oh gosh, what is this? Um, and I don't know how police and governments and educators and parents can keep up with all of this, um, let alone work to keep people safe. So, you know, you ask us, you know, where do we see this going in the next few years? And, and I'm worried and I'm concerned because we're not having the conversations now about how to keep people safe, particularly women. Um, and I'm worried that it's just gonna keep developing too fast and our policies are gonna keep not keeping up and we're just gonna get lost. <laughs> that was less hopeful, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing that. It's, it's really important. Um, and the message is really important as well. So um, we're actually um, a few minutes behind, but I'm going to turn to either Sarah Tatsis or Sarah Shoker um, to, uh, to continue with this question. And then we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, would either of you like to take this one? Okay, go ahead, Sarah Shoker. Uh, your uh, your microphone's on. It, yes. Okay. Has to happen at least once in every meeting, right? Um, yeah. So I completely agree um, with what's been said so far, and uh, I do come at this with, um, I guess, I, I don't want to say a global perspective, but certainly from an international security perspective. And it's always hard to say what the absolute worst. Uh, security threat is going to be, but there are a few that, that come to mind. Um, we know that when it comes to critical infrastructure em emergencies or during times of pandemic, we've seen this before that um, women and girls are disproportionately um, disadvantaged. And especially if we, if we can maybe draw a parallel for, uh, for example, with 
internet shutdowns, when you have internet services removed, which are still ongoing, by the way, I mean, we can think about Belarus, for example, we can think about India, which is the internet shutdown capital of the world. Um, not only are you trying to operate as a not-for-profit, for example, during a time of pandemic, you're also now trying to operate during a time of pandemic without internet access. So how exactly do you reach your clientele? That's already a struggle during uh, during non, uh, non-pandemic period. And oftentimes with when I ask these these kinds of questions to my interviewees they just tell me well actually you just don't operate anymore or you use sort of traditional um, hand-to-hand mouth-to-mouth methods and you rely on really informal networks but it becomes incredibly difficult um, to service uh, to service your beneficiaries in that way and I mean I completely hear you as well on on uh, on misinformation um, and I I think, you know, again, I also agree with what Susie was saying in terms of policymakers maybe not necessarily being prepared for this. One thing that I'm a little nervous about is uh, often there's a a rhetoric, there's this rhetoric or this narrative, um, the thing, you know, somebody please think of the children kind of narrative uh, where politicians or policy leaders might uh, advocate for particular policy responses that actually end up uh, disadvantaging women and children. And I think about, for example, the um, uh, uh, introducing back doors into end-to-end encrypted technologies, um, which you know, which uh, RCMP and also members from the Five Eyes communities have argued are necessary to ensure that you can catch the so-called child pornographers. But you know, when um, when in reality, a uh, policy like this would actually be highly problematic for human rights defenders who use end-to-end encrypted technologies to mobilize politically and uh, under uh, under the un- eyes of often very unfriendly governments. So I'm always a little hesitant, I guess I would say, when I hear policy leaders say that, you know, such, such a, this and that policy might be beneficial to women, when often the, the design of that particular policy doesn't even you know, it might not even include um, the full breadth of stakeholder engagement, um, you know, the very people that you need to hear from when you are actually designing these sorts of responses. That was my turn. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> At work, we call it the Courtney. <laughs> so there's a name for it. Um, all right. So we're going to uh, thank you for that, Sarah. We're, we're actually going to move on to a question that I know a lot of you are, are going to be really uh, interested in. And, and I've seen it already pop into the Q&A. Um, so about privacy. And then we're going to uh, close with uh, just speaking about the initiatives that you're all working on. And I'll start with the question on privacy. So privacy is an issue that all of you have like either like has has cut across much of your domains in different ways. So what does privacy mean to each of you within the context of your work, within the context of your research? And and what are the main challenges? So let's start from a community perspective and then just go into technology um, policy and then legal spaces, uh, and I look over to, to Susie. <laughs> uh, so let's start with Nikki, and then I'll ask Sarah Tatsis, and then Sarah Shoker, and, and then Susie. I, I, I'm not from the tech world like these other lovely humans, um, but I want to recognize that, you know, women, girls, and our LGBTQ folks experience significantly higher levels of violence in in real life online and we've been talking about this all evening but much of that violence it doesn't only target gender so they also targets their race religion sexual orientation age um, your ability and any advancements in policy concerning privacy very similar to what sarah was saying earlier needs to understand this and needs to not just include women but women of all intersectionalities Um, especially when having conversations about privacy. For me in, in my work and in my community role who doesn't understand tech and privacy very well, for me, it's very simple. It's just about being able to hang out online and feel safe. Um, it's about being able to better block trolls and doxers and masqueraders and online bullies. Um, it's about doing away with unnecessary map location and, and stalkerware and things like that. 
um, that actually harm people. And it's about like prioritizing privacy and, and making options for your privacy a lot more obvious and not just um, tiny words like fine print that comes up and you click agree or, or whatever. And, and it's just, it's about being more extensive and maybe having separate policies for youth versus adults. I'm, I'm not sure, but that's kind of how I see privacy. <laughs> Thank you for that. Sarah? Yeah, I think for, I think everybody should be worried about privacy. Um, and you should be worried about the privacy of the data that you're giving to companies. Um, so just taking it from that point of view, like time and time again, like we've seen that companies and a lot of them are big companies, they're not adequately securing customer data. Um, you know, every day there's new breaches, cyber criminals are, they're exploiting um, the pandemic, like they're, they're launching really um, sophisticated attacks. And this year we've seen big companies, big Fortune 500 companies that have had like massive data breaches, you know, Marriott, you know, some of you guys might have been notified of Marriott, uh, you know, Nintendo, MGM, Zoom. Um, you know, and all of these are large companies that they're not able to keep your data from being breached. And, you know, some of that data, when I say data, it actually isn't just like a username or your password. Like in some instances, the data records there are, are things like um, uh, your chat records. Um, they can include like your gender identity, your sexual preferences, uh, chat records, and then they can use this data actually to exploit you um, in terms of like extorting money or, um, you know, ugh, let's just say any way that they could use it in terms of criminal activity. Um, so, you know, I think that this is starting to be recognized. We're starting to see the, um, that this growing importance in data privacy and rights and ownership of, of, uh, of really anything that, that relates to you. Um, I think we'll start to see even more active regulatory landscapes on the horizon and this is going to push companies to adopt like to adopt additional safeguards in in terms of making sure that they're only collecting data that they actually need to give you the service that you have agreed to and not sell your records or you know be doing other things with your data and GDPR is one part of that and I know Susie will probably talk a little bit about uh, you know what's happening more in Canada but I think, I think the good thing is that from a technology perspective, there are more and more security, cybersecurity solutions and services that companies can put in, in place and they need to invest in, in doing that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great new AI and other technologies out there that they're not like, they can be used in wrong ways. They can all, also be used actually as really good ways of protecting privacy and, and making sure that companies um, that have your data are are keeping these, uh, you know, this this trusted information about you um, safe. Um, yeah, I, I think the good thing is, you know, as long as there's companies out there that are are innovating and trying to keep keep us safe, like, you know, I think that that's a really good thing. And um, yeah, we need solutions. We need solutions to be implemented, and some of that needs to be driven likely from from uh, from regula regulations that companies must must implement. That's great, and I think some of those questions will come out in in our Q and A as well um, that I'm seeing. Uh, Sarah, if you'd like to jump in there with uh, your thoughts on the question. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually really interested in hearing what Susie has to, has to say about the new draft for uh, Bill C11. Um, so I'm going to maybe approach this question a little bit sideways and talk about the right to be seen. I find it really, shall I use the word ironic, that we're living in a time where data collection, um, we live in a time where the, the volume of data collection exceeds anything that we ever had in, in human history. And that sounds like a very grandiose claim, but it is, you know, frankly, it's true. Our ability to store data uh, is now unsurpassed. Our ability to collect and process data is unsurpassed. And yet with all of that, um, often the data that we're collecting does not assess gendered vulnerabilities, is still not particularly good at, uh, at identifying how discrimination or social bias can enter into the technical pipeline. Um, 
And part of that is because statistics as uh, the stats or the data, as Susie was alluding to earlier, um, is often collected on a haphazard basis and is uh, highly dependent on the state's capacity to actually collect sex disaggregated data. Um, so in Canada, we, we do that. And it is important sometimes to be able to highlight gender because at that point we're actually able to intervene. Um, data is not, the collection of data is not necessarily always going to be pr problematic. The re it becomes problematic when it's, you know, when any kind of social benefit is subverted by, you know, perhaps a, a, a company's uh, profit motive. Um, but you know, one of the things that we've noted, for example, or that I've noted in, in, in my research is that countries that do manage to collect sex disaggregated data generally have a better record at uh, promoting human rights and women's rights specifically. Um, there's actually a negative relationship between women's access to digital resources and also um, and also sex disaggregated data. So you're less likely to actually know what's going on from a gender perspective if you're not highlighting some of those attributes um, for the purpose of developing sound policy. So data collection, highlighting certain what we might call um, sensitive variables or sensitive attributes about individuals need not necessarily be uh, a bad thing. Um, but I think problematically is that because the regulatory atmosphere has in many ways uh, withdrawn from, I mean, we don't have a lot of regulation of our digital platforms. I know that's, that's, um, that, that is changing slowly, but I think back to the New Zealand mosque shooter and how Ralph Goodale at the time, he was the public safety minister um, and was speaking at a G7 meeting and said, you know, if you do not regulate your platforms, and ensure that you cannot perpetuate hate speech on these platforms, then we will regulate you. Um, and, and to me, that's always a little surprising. I mean, it was, there was clearly a problem. Um, and uh, sorry, my phone is on, on low battery. So I, I know that I, I uh, blipped out there, but uh, so clearly there's a problem. Uh, policymakers, political leaders acknowledge that there's a problem. And thus far, there's been a bit of reluctance to enter into the regulatory uh, environment, I think, because there's a fear that that kind of regulation might dampen um, competition. And uh, also, I think there's also a fear that they will not be able to predict and preempt all the ways that these technologies can be used. Like stalkerware, for example, no one sells stalkerware calling it stalkerware, or at least the, the vast majority of these technologies are not marketed as stalkerware, right? They're usually marketed as child safety devices. And then and that's how they're and that's how they're um, and that's how they're promoted. So they're dual use technologies, right? Um, so I think sometimes political leaders are a little wary or they're unsure of how to predict all the ways that these technologies can be used uh, negatively. And if that's the case, then how exactly do you go into a platform like Facebook, for example, and then say this is how you know you stop subverting democracy <laughs> for, for, for lack of better words. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Susie, we're going to ask you to kind of, uh, this is the, the last general question on privacy. So if you could give us a little tour of, um, of the last couple of weeks and, and your research in general and um, your perspective on this question. Um, yeah, so, so in Canada and globally, there are privacy laws popping up and changing like crazy. People I know who work in global privacy, they're like, can you just give us a break and not have a new privacy law that, that comes up? So here in Canada, we are reforming our um, privacy acts. There's a, a movement to reform our privacy act that deals with uh, the way the government collects our data. And there's been a new bill proposed for uh, commercial data protection. And, and, and that bill has some, some really important changes to it. For, for a long time, our, our privacy commissioners really could only do research into problematic um, corporate use of, of, um, of private data, and they could make recommendations um, and, and reports about how they, they breached this uh, Pepeda, the, the old Privacy Act. We're now the movement um, in this new bill is to actually have a bit of teeth in it. You know, there, there are um, uh, compensatory um, issues that'll come up. And so these companies can get fined um, if, if, they, if they have data breaches and, and, and these types of things. 
and there's going to be, you know, a, a proposed tribunal where, where these issues can go through. And, 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 and hopefully in that we're going to see a lot more robust decisions um, coming out and, and decisions that are enforced. Um, and, and there's a few other really interesting pieces in there. So one of, uh, one of the uh, uh, proposals in it is to have a, a right to have um, decisions that are made algorithmically explained to you about if, if, um, if a corporation is using algorithms to make um, decisions um, based on you that you can then know that. Because often when we look at um, corporate use of, of, of private data and, and just the role of corporations in general, for how um, how the, how they're using our data. Often, these algorithms, um, you know, do have bias in them. Google is very well known for, um, you know, their Google searches. If you were to search professional hair, it was only showing white women's hair. It wasn't showing anyone with curly hair or black hair. You know, and so algorithms have, and they and they also, you know, YouTube's well known for having. Um, algorithms that um, veer towards more extreme content. And this isn't necessarily captured by this privacy bill, but I think that that's something we need to think about when we're regulating and what the role corporations play in this reinforcement of you know, sexist stereotypes and, and, and harmful um, behaviors um, and, and how they moderate content. But yes, yeah, so we do have this new privacy bill that I think will be helpful when it comes to privacy breaches and maybe will start to encourage companies to start thinking about the things that Sarah was talking about around having greater data protection and being more thoughtful about what content is created. And, and I hopefully we'll move a bit more away from this consent model where essentially you check a box and, um, you know, and, and, and there goes your right to your, your, your private information, regardless of whether you've read these enormously long privacy contracts that, that no one reads when they're signing up for social media. So, so yeah, there's interesting changes on that. And, um, and as we become more global, um, and data is, is moving across borders, we end up having to have uh, regulations that match what's happening in Europe or, or the United States. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about that bill, there was a really informative conversation um, by some of the, the leaders in the field. Teresa Skaza in particular is someone who I recommend. Um, follow her on Twitter if you wanna know more about the privacy bill and the, the CLTS, which is out of the University of Ottawa, will be posting that video, I believe sometime this week. Um, and it's very informative and, and explains a lot of the ins and outs of that bill. Uh, for myself, I do a lot of um, research on torts and criminal law and the way that privacy is understood um, on that individual level. So it's not so much looking at the, the corporate harms, but looking at individual harms. And one of the legal concepts that I've been looking at quite a lot is this, this concept of what's a reasonable expectation of privacy and, and when is information private or not, you know, and um, in a recent case, um, on a voyeurism case, you know, there was these arguments um, about whether privacy is only, uh, you only get privacy if your information is indoors, if you're in a private place, if it's hidden, um, or if it, we can have a more contextual view of privacy. And the courts are, are leaning more towards this idea of, of contextually analyzing data and information to understand whether it's private or not. And, and in the recent Supreme Court case, um, R.B. Jarvis, that came out, they had this really interesting nine factor case, um, nine factor list on how to analyze whether someone should have a reasonable expectation of privacy that looked at things like, what is the relationship between the people who are um, capturing these images? You know, was it captured by technology or was it um, a privacy invasion that happened in, in person? You know, so, so I think that courts are, are leaning more towards that. But one of the arguments um, that one of the interveners made um, where I was acting as a, a pro bono um, uh, legal researcher for them, uh, we had argued that you need, to, you need to consider equality because I think a lot of what Sarah and Nikki were talking about is equality and privacy intersect in this really interesting way. And we think about the way we understand privacy, we understand it very differently depending on our social location. When you look at privacy invasions, if you are a black person, you know that chances are your privacy may be invaded by getting pulled over by the police inappropriately, by getting carded inappropriately. Women experience sexual privacy invasions all the time. When they're in public, they experience sexual street harassment. People inquire about their bodies in ways that are incredibly inappropriate. If you're a disabled person, you know, people are inquiring uh, about you in different ways. And so depending on what your social location is, you have different experiences of privacy. And the more privileged you are, the more you're able to be obscure in society. 
And the more marginalized you are, the more apparent you are in society. And, and when we're thinking about the legal definitions of privacy, I think we need to take those equality factors and social contexts into consideration in legal decisions. And for the Jarvis um, decision, I think that's one place where they, they did have a gap. You know, both um, LEAF, the Women's Legal Education uh, and Action Fund, and CIPIC, which is a legal clinic out of the University of Ottawa, had argued that equality should be a specific factor to take into consideration when, when the legal system is deciding whether someone has uh, a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, but it wasn't explicitly noted by the Supreme Court of Canada. And I think it's something that we as lawyers um, need to be pushing for is to having privacy understood as a human rights and have equality be um, a factor for us to seriously consider every time that we think about privacy and be looking for places where marginalized groups don't benefit from privacy in the same way uh, people who are in positions of privilege uh, do. Thank you for that. That was... Um that really kind of encapsulated uh, like all of the points. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really hard to, I mean, I feel hopeful and in looking at the questions in the Q and A, there is like one that constantly repeats and, and, and we'll, go, um, we'll go through this last question and then we'll jump over to the Q and A. Um, so it, it, it's hard not to feel overwhelmed about all of these challenges that we're hearing about. And this ties back into that question that keeps on popping up in Q&A. Um, so how are each of our panelists, so how have you guys been pushing boundaries, creating tools, advocating for awareness and change and developing new and exciting initiatives? So um, we'll start with Sarah Tatsis. So Sarah, can you tell us about the Digital Defenders Program uh, that you helped launch at BlackBerry with the Girl Guides of Canada in 2019, I believe? Um, and why do you feel that it's important to spark an early interest in cybersecurity? Um, and if you could also tie that in with some of the work and your interest in the work that you're doing at uh, Sar Optimist International. Yeah, last year, BlackBerry launched uh, the Digital Defenders Program. And what it was was a partnership with the Girl Guides of Canada. And it was aimed at that early interest in cybersecurity industry. Um, so depending on the age group, like Sparks all the way up through Pathfinders, the Girl Guides actually would complete like a number of activities. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Girl Guides or, or Boy Scouts or you know other organizations like that. So you do a series of activities and then you learn a badge or you earn a badge through those activities. And, so BlackBerry actually worked on the uh, providing our cybersecurity expertise with the girl guides who are really fantastic at creating program uh, programming um, for these uh, for these activities. And like as an example, for instance, we introduced the topic of encryption um, to Spark. So you know, age group you know five and six year olds, and try to like spark. Uh, interest in encryption as a topic and how do you do it actually through through um, paint matching is is what we used as the activity in there um, so yeah like once you know it was really interesting for Blackberry to do this we actually used an an, an all-female engineering team uh, to provide the the cybersecurity expertise and the um, uh, it, it was it was quite interesting because the girl guys they've done a lot of research actually on um, on women in STEM and and girls in terms of like joining STEM fields and like I talked about earlier you know we need more representation in these fields I think to to really um, have have an impact on some of the things we talked about now but some of their research actually showed that um, they went out and surveyed. Uh, children between the ages of 12 and 18 and they asked if people agreed with the sentence with the with a sentence that basically said that boys are more capable than girls of doing things such as learning math and science playing sports and taking on leadership roles and so they asked how many of you agree with that statement and over a quarter agreed with it so like not only like we're not talking about we're talking about how early some of like the stereotypes around um, gender and um, you know and some of these activities are actually ingrained. Um, and then the girl guides really have this great um, 
I'd say history of, of introducing um, topics and allowing girls to explore STEM fields in a way that um, that's non-threatening and um, in a really safe and secure environment. And I think like the reason we, we did this is, you know, there's a way here for, for us to encourage more people to go into the cybersecurity field and get some diversity. Um, I know I mentioned earlier, but cybersecurity itself is really, um, there's a real labor shortage. So there's 4 million global open roles for cybersecurity uh, professionals out there. And if we leave out half the population um, that's capable of going into these fields, it would not be a shame, right? Like we really need like more professionals in this space. So I think BlackBerry is doing some, some really neat things around that too, but that's a really, um, I guess, pragmatic example of something that BlackBerry did. Um, in terms of Sir Optimus International, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we're, we're running a Dream It Be It program, and that is really focused on career support for teenage girls. Uh, so really encouraging girls to overcome obstacles um, and, and enter uh, you know, careers that, that they feel um, really compelled to enter. And we're also uh, running, um, running a Live Your Dream Awards as well, which provides you know, uh, awards to women in the community that would like to go back to school um, and are primary financial um, caregivers for their, for their families. And so you know, providing additional awards to them so that they can continue to do that. And I think, yeah, I think tonight, you know, it's great. Like here in Kitchener, Waterloo, we're right at the, at the um, right location, I think, to be having this discussion. You know, we're a hub uh, for cybersecurity expertise globally um, with both the companies that are here, BlackBerry being one of them, but there's many other. And then the universities that are focused in this space and obviously CG as well. So, so yeah, that, that's at least from BlackBerry's perspective and Sir Optimus, some of the things we're doing. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to go over to Nikki next. Uh, Nikki, last November, you launched a curriculum to raise awareness about sex trafficking for grade seven and eight students. Um, can you tell us about uh, this and what the response has been so far? Oh, there we go. Ah, isn't it for me? <laughs> it, it is for this. And I'm going to ask just because we're, we're short on time um, with Nikki and then Susie and then Sarah Shoker, if we can I know it's it's uh, it's unjust because you have so many great examples to speak about, but if we can keep our um, responses to about a minute so we can get to a few of the Q&A questions. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Nikki. Yep, developed by our center. It's called Reset, Recognizing Exploitation, a Syllabus and Trafficking. Um, this is a curriculum to address human trafficking and sexual exploitation for 12 to 15 year olds. The average age of entry into sex trafficking is actually 13. So we're hitting the, the right age group. Um, you know, it's a curriculum that provides information activities about, you know, vulnerability. What is it? Exploitation, consent, healthy relationships, um, how to be safe on social media and online. We believe youth are our allies. We want to partner with youth and help them recognize trafficking and exploitation because they're the ones who are going to see it amongst their peers. They're the ones who are going to recognize it first. Um, and we believe in that pretty strongly. Uh, it's done well. Our region has purchased and will be implementing our uh, curriculum into the into you know our curriculum. Um, we're still working out the details and what that will look like. We're a little delayed because of the pandemic. Um, three other, three or four no, four other school boards in Ontario have purchased it. We have several looking into it. And then we have folks in Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan and Alberta also looking into it. That's fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that, Nikki. That's great. <laughs> awesome. Um, so next, Susie, uh, you've helped draft two international commitments to end gender-based violence in digital contexts. So both for G7 and the UN and was part of the legal team that supported the Samuelson Glushko Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic um, intervention in RV Jarvis. Can you tell us about this and some of uh, the other research and advocacy you're, you're a part of? Yeah, I'll be very quick. So both of those um, international um, decisions, I think are really great advocacy tools. I'll post them in the chat so people can have a look at them. 
I was just working with Global Affairs Canada and consulting with them and, and helping them write those up. And they're just great tools that you can use to, to advocate for governments who have signed on and said these are things they're committing to and we need to take action on tech violence. Um, RV Jarvis was a really interesting case um, that, that revolved around this question of reasonable expectation of privacy of girls who had had secret images um, taken of their bodies by a, a teacher who was using a camera pen. Um, and in the end, that case was won. And, and, and the Supreme Court decision is really, really good. Like, I think it does move towards an equality focused perspective on privacy. Like, we wanted to push it a little bit further. Um, but I, I, I really recommend um, people reading that case if they're interested in um, the concept of reasonable expectation of privacy. I've also got a book chapter um, coming out soon with uh, Kristen Thomason, who's a great um, scholar at UBC. Um, so that'll be coming out soon. And two other plugs I want to make for really, I think, much more practical research and, and work that I've been doing is, is one, uh, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund has a, um, a tech facilitated violence working group that I'm a part of. Uh, Cynthia Ku, who is also an incredible um, leader in um, all things tech, um, is writing a report for LEAF that looks at the ways that internet intermediaries, like all the social media companies, should be um, possibly regulated or, or, or thinking about the ways that they, um, they contribute to, to gender-based violence. And the third project, which is one that I'm, I'm really proud of, and I just love this organization, is the BC Society of Transition Houses. So they have been doing really incredible work on creating toolkits and resources for people who are experiencing tech facilitated violence so that they can do their own safety planning, they can do their own cybersecurity planning. Um, and then we're also uh, currently working on a uh, project where we're um, helping people who might be self-represented in courts understand how to collect digital evidence if they're experiencing tech facilitated violence um, and what they need to do in order to get that submitted to courts. And I think that's gonna be an incredibly practical tool. Um, and, and I think practicality is so important. Like I think the theoretical work that, that I'm doing is important too, but really it's the on the ground work with, with people who are experiencing this that's, that's very important. So I recommend um, anyone who's doing direct um, work with people to look at the BC Society of Transition House um, website. That's fantastic. And maybe we can put those up on, on the chat as well. Um, for our audience. Um, and so Sarah Shoker, can you tell us about a really cool social impact firm that you founded, Glassbox, and how you're training industry to identify and mitigate algorithmic discrimination? But you also mentioned to me that you're working on, a, on prototyping a predictive algorithm to help predict um, internet shutdowns and discuss maybe the intersection of that and how women are using that as a tool to resist Oh, of course, right. Um, okay, so uh, this actually started off in uh, late 2019. I was contracted out by Global Affairs Canada to help uh, gender mainstream Canada cybersecurity strategy. And uh, the purpose of that, I mean, I, I represent my own views. I do not represent any any other employer here. Um, the, I was contracted as an independent researcher and the paper that came out from that is actually publicly available if anyone is interested in reading it. It was translated also in French, but it's called Making Gender Visible in Digital ICTs and International Security. And the purpose of that paper uh, is that Canada is uh, interested in bringing uh, gendered norms or making gender visible uh, at the on the international stage. Uh, the United Nations is currently uh, hosting um, some very fraught discussions about cybersecurity and uh, cyber, cyber uh, and the ways states should conduct themselves um, at the international level when it comes to cybersecurity. So that was the inspiration there. And when I ended up interviewing a number of participants who had experienced internet shutdowns, what I found was that uh, individuals were trying, were essentially trying to warn each other and uh, they were becoming a community-based early warning system uh, and were telling people that, okay, I think that we're going to experience a social media blockage on such and such day. So that actually got me thinking and that really planted the idea. I, you know, I have a background in, I'm, I'm a social scientist, but I have a background in researching data-driven technologies. Uh, so I, I submitted a, a uh, another proposal to a, a, a uh, another competition hosted by global affairs a different division and won that 
Um, so we're building a prototype and we actually just completed it with a policy being submitted at the end of this month um, that looked that used Belarus as a case study uh, to see whether we could actually use public social media data to predict uh, whether in, when internet shutdowns would occur. And uh, since we were talking about privacy, I think I should probably say that we do not use anyone's names. Uh, we use natural language processing amongst some other models to make those predictive outcomes. Um, and in terms of who's using that, well, currently no one because we're, we're in the process of building it and we just finished our prototype. But that came out from a larger desire to use, uh, I guess, tech for good or tech for humanitarian aims. Um, and I found Glassbox originally because I saw that people, especially within military circles, uh, had absolutely no idea, with, you know, with all due respect to everyone involved, how social values were being translated into the technical pipeline. And I had just spent five years essentially doing work on how you know on how this actually occurred. So, if anyone is interested, we do host workshops. Um, we do tailor them to uh, respond to an organization's needs or their questions. Um, but basically, it's not magic. It's not science. There are ways to identify and mitigate uh, certain risks involving biases, uh, involving biases and algorithmic discrimination. So that's something that I've been doing as a as a that was motivated by by my research. And that's amazing. And I was so uh, just, it, it, it's so timely and the work that you're doing is really, uh, and all of you, the work that you're doing is, is really amazing. Um, I'm going to jump over to, um, I'm going to jump over. I think we'll have time for one question, sadly, but it's going to be the question that's been, that's been asked by four or five different um, audience members. And the question is, well, in, in different ways, um, but what can we do as individuals to help keep women safe? So that starts with a, a question to start with, um, if Nikki could start with that, but then the questions uh, then go into how can we get uh, involved in these issues to, issues to help, sorry. And then um, is there a role that citizens can play in raising awareness and addressing these issues? So. This is uh, a top of mind for a lot of our audience. And um, if anyone, if all of you have a, a, a piece to say in this, please go ahead and contribute. That would be great. And Nikki, we'll start with you since you were. <laughs> a really uh, tough question to answer because we have to look at all the different levels um, from you know policy development to, to who's creating these apps and, and who's taking care of the privacy and security and, and folks like us on the ground who are running around um, trying to trying to co collect it all and make sense of it and teach people. So I really think education is a big piece, um, educating women, young girls, children, uh, vulnerable folks um, about these things and and not just educating them, but working with them on understanding why is this an issue? You know, we run a workshop for adults and caring, caring adults and people who are, in, who have vulnerable youth in their life or just youth who are online a lot. And we talk about how you, you yourself need to know what the problem is before you can teach it. Um, get curious. Uh, there's lots of resources online about finding out how apps work, how they tick, what are, what are the privacy settings, how to be safe, what are the dangers. Um, get curious, don't overreact if, if something is going on because that's so common now, like, you know, create a supportive environment for folks to be able to talk to you about what's going on. Um, and yeah, just invite women to the table and support agencies who are doing this work, um, particularly our VAW community-based organizations. Great, thank you. Um, Sarah Tatsis, you, would you yeah. like to, yeah? Yeah, I think there is a lot of online resources. So yeah, go take a look. There's a good one that's actually published by uh, the government of Canada, which is getcybersafe.gc.ca. Uh, it's a good starting point. Um, there's also, I, I find the, there's a commissioner of cybersecurity in Australia. Their website also is actually, it's Stephen, like it's it's a really good one too, and I think yeah, if you as parents can can spend time with your children, but also I mean just the fact you're here today, you're you're improving your awareness of what's happening out there, um, and get involved. Like I think getting involved at the community level is a great way of doing that, and then if you have the ability to like influence things, um, like don't 
and make decisions and you know don't don't be afraid to do those um, and really represent the, what's happening to to uh, in the space around technology assistant gender based violence. Great, thank you. And uh, Susie or Sarah, would you like to contribute to that question? I mean, I can just point out that I, I received an email today from Kapersky, which is another security firm, um, and they just launched Tiny Check, which is used to detect stalkerware on one's phone. So there's that resource. And I'll also point out that uh, people are really quite, um, individuals, women and girls and other marginalized communities actually are really creative with how they interact with online space. So we can think, for example, of even hashtags like Me Too or Bring Back Our Girls, which try to name and shame certain perpetrators and create this kind of discursive awareness that has actually had a tremendous amount of impact. Not all efforts to combat gender violence need to be highly centralized. You can have informal social networks that can uh, still be very impactful and influential. Um, and I'll also point to a few other apps. So out of the Arab Spring, um, an app called Harass Map came out and it uses the Google Maps API where essentially individuals can go on and highlight where they've been sexually harassed on uh, Egypt's streets um, so that they can warn other women to either, you know, to be cautious of, of that particular area. Um, and that app was so successful that it's actually been brought in by other countries. So wherever you go, yes, technology, there is technology facilitated violence. Tech can sometimes also be the solution, um, or at least it can be used to help adapt um, as, as an adaptive measure. Um, and to that point, I'll say that a number of these initiatives have unfortunately, are, do unfortunately rest on the shoulders of women and girls and other marginalized constituencies, which is, I would say, fundamentally unfair that not only you have to deal with all of this nonsense, but you're also, you also have to be, you know, your own architect for getting out of the muck that society has trapped you in. But nevertheless, um, women, girls, other marginalized individuals are incredibly resilient. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in learning more, there is a hashtag called tech for good. Um, also civic tech might be of interest to you as well, um, that you can peruse online and see other examples of how people have been using technology to try and rectify some of the imbalances that tech has actually has also caused. Great. Uh, thanks for that. And Susie, would you like to uh, send, a, send us off and then I will um, do all of our I'll, finish with our closing remarks. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I think I echo all of the things that Sarah and Sarah and Nikki have said, you know, like the supporting the work that's already being done on the ground by individual people, supporting uh, people who are getting into this field, who are coming in with an equality-based perspective and in creating this technology. Um, and then also like, like show me the money, like pay these women, pay them and pay for these centers and pay for these organizations, like the e-safety commissioner in, uh, in, the, in Australia is funded by the government. Um, and that pays for research and that pays for work. And that's a direct place where people can go and get support. Um, we're seeing cybersecurity, pro bono cybersecurity clinics popping up all over the world. There isn't really much in Canada right now other than you know, CyberTip, CyberScan, and uh, the, the organization out of Manitoba. We need more of these organizations paid for, um, for organizations like Nikki's that's already doing the work. They need extra funding to, to get caught up on all this tech stuff that they have to get, get, uh, get caught up for. So I think the best way to, um, to stop violence against women you know, is to fund these organizations so that they can change society, they can change law and they can provide direct support. So, so that's my push, my final push for the night. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, it's odd not to have an audience <laughs> when you're at the end, but thanks. Uh, I mean, I know the audience is there. I mean, an audience that you can actually hear clapping at the end of, of such a fantastic panel. Um, amazing insights. Thank you for all of the wonderful examples that you've shared with us. Uh, thank you for all of your insights, for all the research and work that you do on a daily basis to really bring these issues uh, to the forefront. Um, so thank you to you and thank you for the, uh, to the audience for these fantastic questions and my apologies for not getting to them. There were wonderful questions, but maybe I can work with uh, Andrea somewhere in the background to see if we can post some of these questions and, and have a, an answer, a Q&A um, offline. Um, I'd like to thank CG and the and Sir Optimus International Kitchener Waterloo chapter for hosting this event. 
um, and BlackBerry for sponsoring this event. Um, and I'd like to encourage uh, our audience uh, to visit cgonline.org, that's C-I-G-I online.org to check out our events and publications, sorry, CG's events and publications. <laughs> and then um, encourage uh, the audience to also visit uh, seroptimistkw org to learn more about uh, Sir Optimus International um, Kitchener Waterloo programming. So thank you very much, everyone. Oh, wait, I'm missing one. Am I? Yes, the last piece was, <laughs> I almost forgot, that the this recorded event will be available online at cgonline.org in a few days. So that's it. Thanks very much, everyone. Oh.